Recent studies have demonstrated the prevalence and incidence of grandiose pathological narcissism bordering on psychopathy as defined by Robert Hare among social justice activists and other mass movements. One such recent study had been published a few months ago in British Columbia. And there is also a study conducted, actually three studies conducted by Israelis, and they had suggested a new personality construct called the tendency for interpersonal victimhood, or TIV. It seems that when mass movements start and when they are concerned with justice, social justice, interpersonal justice, legal justice, financial justice, any form of justice, sooner or later, these movements are hijacked, infiltrated, infested with, contaminated by psychopaths and narcissists. And these psychopaths and narcissists tend to rise to the top because they seek attention, they are concerned with narcissistic supply, if they are narcissists, money and power, and sex, if they are psychopaths. These people become the public face of these social movements. They are the outspoken ones. There's a silent majority and the tip of an iceberg minority of psychopaths and narcissists who make it to the mass media, who get interviewed everywhere, who aggrandize themselves and become not only the face of the movement, but the movement. So they tend to consider themselves as reifications of the principles, ideologies, ideas, stratagems, attitudes of the movements which they purportedly and self-imputedly represent. This is a very, very insidious, nefarious, pernicious, dangerous, sick phenomenon. phenomenon. And it had been happening throughout history. The French Revolution was hijacked by the likes of Danton and Robespierre and others, very, very mentally ill people, psychopaths and narcissists. So um, the Russian Revolution, the, the famous October Revolution, had gone through two stages. Initial, it was initiated by middle-class bourgeoisie, well-balanced people, but then it, it, it had been hijacked by total psychopaths like Lenin and Stalin. So social movements have this tendency. It's nothing new throughout history. In my own small case in 1995, I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse. And for nine years, my website has been the only website on narcissism. And I maintained ran and owned the only six support groups for victims of narcissistic abuse. This gradually became a global movement. I launched it over nine years and then I lost control in 2004. And the movement now throughout the world is in the hand of con artists, psychopaths, narcissists, scammers, I mean, it's a cesspool and a cesspit. Um, covert narcissists pretending to be victims, victims pretending to be experts, experts who know nothing about the condition. Clearly, I had launched inadvertently a mass movement that had been hijacked later by psychopaths and narcissists. Nothing new under the sun. Now, all social justice movements and all justice concern movements goes through certain phases. Many of these movements are focused and centered around the concept of victimhood. So they are what I would call victimhood movements. Now, victimhood victims are entitled to justice and they are entitled to pursue justice by any legal means available. They're also 
very welcome to organize. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing in society when victims organize to reclaim what's theirs, to reclaim their rights, and even to undergo a public healing process. For example, in, in South Africa, the popular courts that had tried perpetrators in the, in the, truth, in the truth and justice movements. So this is in itself is a healthy phenomenon. The problem is when the movement is again kidnapped and infiltrated by psychopaths and narcissists and changes its character. Now, every social justice movement goes through phases. It starts with legitimate grievances. Victims, people who are deprived, people who are disenfranchised, ignored, people who suffer or pay the price for, for other people's actions or inaction, people who are the victims, advertent or inadvertent, of trends such as globalization and automation and the transition to the service and information economy. There are numerous types of victims. People can, can be victimized owing to their sexual orientation, to their sex, to their race, to their ethnicity. I mean, we discriminate against each other and we torture each other based on differences. If you are slightly different to me, then you don't belong. You're not in my group, in the in-group. You're an other, you're outside the group. And we tend, we tend to direct, redirect aggression, individual aggression and group aggression at others. This is the concept of the other. And so most victims, if not all victims, and most groups of people have legitimate grievances. Now, some of these grievances has to do with specific cases, specific individuals, specific institutions, circumstances. And some of these grievances have to do with the system, systemic bias, systemic discrimination, systemic prejudice. Women had been subjected to a systematic pillage and plunder of their gifts and denial of their rights. So have African Americans. So have the Jews through thousands of years and so on and so forth. Homosexuals, of course. So sometimes the system and its dominant ideology uh, targets specific groups of people denies them their rights, sequesters them, demonizes them, and then punishes them in a variety of ways, not the least of which is the economic way, as Fukuyama had observed in a series of brilliant works in the past 20 years. So this economic punishment. So they are legitimate grievances. Victims wake up. They wake up when they compare themselves to others who are not members of their group. They wake up when there is a general tsunami wave of rights and human rights and civil rights, and they want to be included in this tidal wave of rearranging rights and societal rights and obligations. They wake up when things really, really become bad, intolerable, unsupportable, when the victim group hits rock bottom, when blacks are massacred by police, for example, when, the, when climate change uh, has led to extreme weather everywhere. This is when we hit rock bottom, when the pandemic is raging all over the globe because of its initial mismanagement by governments and so on. These are all cases of hitting rock bottom. And then people organize and they try to reverse history to reverse the trend. And the thing is, they're often very success successful. For example, the civil rights movement in the United States in the 50s and 60s had been quite successful. So the precedent is that if you get your act together as a victim, you're likely to become much less of a victim. It's an incentive. So legitimate grievances often lead to 
organization. There is a system, an oppressing system, the patriarchy, uh, in the case of uh, women, white society, in the case of, of uh, blacks, Nazi Germany, in the case of Jews. There's an oppressing system and the victims organize, in effect, a counterculture. They organize an opposing system and then it becomes the clash of two systems. The problem is that most of these counter systems, most of these victimhood based systems, they tend to deteriorate very fast to identity politics. And then what we have is a mirror image of the practices of the majority, of the oppressing majority. So you can find today racism among blacks, which is even more virulent, which is even less justified than the racism among whites. Blacks had become the aggressors and the racists as a counter reaction, counter reformation, if, if you wish, against the prevailing dominant hierarchy and, and system. So, Identity politics is a very powerful tool for these groups because identity creates cohesion. Cohesion creates a laser-focused action, and laser-focused action is power. Cohesion is power, and you cannot obtain cohesion unless you foster a sense of togetherness, of we-ness, of identity. And so identity politics also relies on intersectionality. And intersectionality is a very fancy name to say that most people are victimized based on more than one parameter. So, for example, a black woman, she would be victimized as a black and she would be victimized as a woman. A homosexual Jew would be victimized as, a homo as homosexual and as a Jew, let alone a transgender Native American and whatever. Oh, there are numerous combinations of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, place of birth, origin, level of education, level of socioeconomic attainment, and so on and so forth. They're all grounds for discrimination and bias. The bias can be explicit, can be an integral part of an overt ideology, for example, anti-immigration, um, white supremacy. These are overt biases and prejudices, totally non-scientific and nonsensical, but the bias can be implicit bias. The way, for example, medical doctors relate to black patients. In shocking surveys, we find time and again that white medical doctors assume that black people have a different physiology. For example, that they have thicker skin and they experience much less pain. So, bias is, is, is a poison. It permeates, it pervades the social fabric. And the only way to get rid of bias is to get rid of the social fabric. Then movements adopt identity politics and intersectional ideologies, contra-intersectional ideologies, in ways that render them subversive. They become, in effect, insurgencies in very extreme cases. They deteriorate into domestic terrorism. But even in the more benign cases, these homegrown grassroots movements, they tend to become very, very aggressive, exclusionary, identity-oriented, hermetic, schizoid, closed-in, defiant, contumacious. There's an attack on authority. And if you're thinking, well, this, is a, this list sounds like a psychopath. You're right. This is the list of traits of a psychopath. These identity politics groups, these victimhood-centered groups, tend to become psychopathic as an integral dynamic, not related on particular individuals as members of the group or particular individuals as leaders. The dynamic of a group is psychopathy. They develop collective psychopathy. Very often, often victimhood groups also tend to compensate for their sense of innate inferiority and for the humiliation of having been a victim, they tend to compensate with grandiosity. So in the narcissistic abuse movement today, we have empaths. Empaths are angels. 
They can do nothing wrong. They are wonderful people. They are amazing. They are perfect. They are, in other words, narcissists. So, grandiosity and psychopathy tend to evolve naturally as an emergent phenomenon in victimhood-centered social justice movement, movements long before they are hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths. Actually, narcissists and psychopaths gravitate to these movements owing to their increasing narcissistic and psychopathic profile. And so then we have the tendency for victimhood, which is this new construct. We have these studies that show, you know, psychopaths and narcissists as active members, not only leaders. And the whole thing deteriorates into demonizing, mudslinging, partisanship, aggression in extreme cases, recently not so extreme and not so rare, even violence. Now, there's a big difference between left-leaning um, victimhood movements, right-leaning victimhood movements, and neutral movements. An example of a neutral movement would be the narcissistic abuse movement, because it incorporates uh, uh, people with leftist views, people with rightist views, and so on. It's centered around the injustice done to victims of narcissistic abuse by narcissists and psychopaths. It is, it is undergoing the very same process. It had become more and more grandiose, and it had been taken over by psychopathic and narcissistic con artists and scammers, all these online coaches and experts and so on. But still, it is neutral in the political sense. Left-leaning, left-leaning um, victimhood-centered movements tend to focus on entitlement and grandiosity. They compensate with grandiosity, entitlement, and they are fantastic in nature. For example, they seek to rewrite history counterfactually. So women are doing this in the feminist movement. They are rewriting the history of the world as though it had been centered around women, when actually women had always been, uh, since the agricultural revolution, marginal in world affairs. Blacks have African, uh, African American studies departments where they rewrite history to render blacks the builders of the nation and the greatest contributors to science and literature, which is utter, sheer, unmitigated, counterfactual nonsense. So there is grandiose compensation and a sen deep sense of entitlement. These are two main features of narcissism because they lead to a lack of empathy. And if you talk to blacks in any setting, with any conviction, members of these movements or not, they have become much less empathic. They sound very narcissistic, I must say. And I'm sure I'll get a million comments <laughs> about this, this element. So this is the left-leaning movements. Entitlement, grandiosity. The right-leaning movements combine two different, two other psychological traits. Conspiracism, which is the tendency to believe in conspiracy theories as organizing and explanatory principles. Conspiracism, coupled with grandiosity, for example, in white supremacy, coupled with schizoid tendencies, the wish to be left alone, small government, no taxation, no foreign, no adventures in foreign lands, America first. So, the right-leaning movements, they tend to be more conspiracy-minded, they tend to be more, um, more monkish, more with, they have centered around withdrawal, around avoidance, much less around entitlement. They are afraid of entitlement, actually, because they translate entitlement to bigger government, more intrusive government, nanny state, big, big, big brother, 1984 Orwellian things. So their conspiracism actually prevents right-wing movements from becoming fully narcissistic because they deny the element of entitlement. But they have a pronounced lack of empathy, much bigger than in, in the left victimhood-centered movements, and they are much more psychopathic in the sense that they are much less averse 
to using aggression, they are much more defiant. They are much more contumacious. They detest authority, clean the swamp, drain the swamp in Washington. So they are more psychopathic. To summarize, the left is narcissistic, entitled and grandiose. It's centered around victimhood and translates victimhood into claims on society. Claim, they claim rights, they claim money, reparations for slavery the, or reparations for the Holocaust. They claim, so it's more entitlement oriented. And what can I get out of it? <laughs> and the right wing groups, entitlement groups are less, they are not exactly victimhood groups. They are victims of conspiracies, but not victims of society or systemic because they are mostly white. Right wing groups are mostly white. They belong to the majority. They are less likely to present themselves as victims. They may be victims of impersonal forces, such as globalization or the collapse of manufacturing in the United States or auto automation or whatever. But they are more focused on withdrawal, avoidance, and using power where necessary to protect rights, for example, gun rights. In the middle, we have the neutral movements, the social, the justice movements. They are not social justice movements, they are individual justice movements, like the narcissistic abuse movement. And these movements in the middle, they have the worst of both worlds, actually. They have entitlement, they have grandiosity, but they also have defiance, contumaciousness, um, and conspiracy, conspiracy oriented paranoia. This is the picture. When narcissists and psychopaths observe these groups, what they see is a gold mine. It's a new pathological narcissistic space. They can thrive in these settings. They can become leaders. They can become media figures. They can obtain narcissistic supply. They can make money. They can have sex with followers and fans. It's fun. It's great. It's a playground. It's a haunt. It's a pub. And so Narcissists and psychopaths flock into these movements and because of their particular personality structure. Narcissists know how to be charming. Narcissists verbalize much better than the average population. Many narcissists and psychopaths are highly intelligent and all of them are goal-oriented. They are reckless, they are callous, they are disempathic, they are relentless. So they rise to the top. They become the leaders of these, of, uh, these movements. And this is how all these movements end. Even hallowed saintly figures like Martin Luther King, Gandhi, on, in other ways, gurus like Jordan Peterson and so on, they have pronounced narcissistic elements and traits and, and so on. When you look, uh, when you listen to the FBI recordings of, of Martin Luther King, I mean, it's far from impressive. <laughs> and when you read the autobiography of, of Gandhi, you come across sections which put your hair on end. I mean, the guy was, you know, near psychopath. So there's no escaping this. Victims organize, create a counterculture, a counter, counter system. It becomes more and more narcissistic, more and more grandiose more and more entitled, more and more paranoid. And then it becomes more and more psychopathic as it, it accumulates aggression, which is directed by an ideology, interpolated, as Althusser called it. And then it's taken over by narcissists and psychopaths. I hope I made things clear because last time I mentioned only Black Lives Matter and Me, the Me Too movements and the climate change movement with the, with the Greta. But now I've, I've, mentioned, I've mentioned also right-wing movements and neutral movements. It's all over. Whenever people organize to claim justice, they become narcissists and psychopaths. It raises the interesting question whether narcissism and psychopathy are not actually misguided, misdirected attempts by individuals to reclaim justice, having been subjected to early childhood trauma. Interesting thought, narcissists and psychopaths as victims of early childhood trauma, claiming what's theirs, regaining their rights and establishing some justice using an ideology, a personal ideology, which is akin to religion in the case of narcissism. 
that actually aggrandizes, entitles and tramples on other people.